Welcome to It Happened in Grand Prairie, Texas. As we bring you our history show and our history number 447, we're just very delighted to continue our history show, but with a special flavor this month. This is Black History Month we're celebrating, and we are so pleased to have a very special, a genuinely wonderful couple for Grand Prairie, Texas, as our very first show of Black History Month. And we're so pleased to have Pastor Davis, Pastor Denny Davis, and Wanda, his beautiful wife. Welcome to the set. Thank you, good to be here. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you for inviting us today. You're just welcome as the flowers in May. And uh, Pastor Denny, this is your camera, this is our camera, and this is my camera. So now we know that we're oriented very well as to where we're supposed to look and do, aren't we? Um, as history tape number 447, we thought it would be appropriate to uh, ask you to help us uh, really establish a point in Grand Prairie, Texas. Whether or not you live in Grand Prairie, Texas, you are one of the most important young men and family in Grand Prairie, Texas. And we would like for you to look out into your camera and tell us about the real Pastor Davis before he became the illustrious one. We'd like for you to name your parents and any siblings or something about yourself as a young man. Well, first of all, I want to say, Ms. Jackson, thank you for the wonderful compliment. I never really consider myself as being one of the most important or influential. I feel a call, upon, a call of God upon my life to make a difference. And with regards to that, I try to commit myself to that task. And if by chance someone recognizes that what I'm doing is commendable, I praise and thank God for that. Yes. Uh, as far as my beginnings are concerned, I was born to Almeida and Andrew Davis in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. It's a twin city in the center of uh, the state of Illinois. In relationship to that, particularly, I was raised in Urbana, U-R-B-A-N-A. A lot of people don't uh, recognize Urbana separated from Champaign. Uh -huh. Even though Urbana is the oldest city, Champaign came later. The city is recognized also because it's the home of the University of Illinois, the Fighting Illini. Along those lines, I was raised there. I attended public school in Urbana. I attended uh, elementary as well as junior high at that time. Would you name your elementary school? That's an interesting piece of my history because when I started elementary school, I attended Dr. Hayes Elementary School. Mm -hmm. After my kindergarten year, the school was renamed to Dr. Martin Luther King Elementary School. How wonderful, and you were there as a student. I was there as a student, uh -huh. but the interesting part about that is I also became acquainted with desegregation. And yes. so, even though the school was in my community and just blocks from my home, I was a part of the first group that was bused to the other side of town. And so I did elementary school at Dr. Hayes. The next year was changed to Dr. Martin Luther King. And then I was also bused to the other side of town to attend Weber. A, a double busing. A double that, busing. Oh, that is, isn't that an exciting piece of history? And uh, when you were in, uh, uh, your elementary grades, were there special people, mentors, or teachers that really helped you get into the scene from kindergarten and even into the first grade, and or were there influences in your life at that time? I had some wonderful influences between neighbors and uh, business owners and community, but then also in the interest of this issue of being a part of desegregation and being put into an uh, environment that I was not familiar with. Uh, Miss Hines was my first grade teacher, and she was a tremendous blessing to my life in helping me adapt. But not only that, but since that time, I've had the privilege of going back to Illinois as recent as a year or so ago, and I had the opportunity to visit with her and share with her how important it was for her to take the time that she did and the tenderness that she uh, handled this issue of desegregation. What a blessing. Yes, did you have brothers or sisters? I was my mother's only child. 
only child. Oh, he was pampered already, <laughs> Wanda, but even before you got hold of him. Yes, that is wonderful. But my mother never treated me like an only child. Uh -huh. Was my, she a tough taskmaster? She was tough. My mother grew up in a family with 18 siblings. Yes. And so with regards to that, she recognized the importance of every member of the family having duties and responsibilities. And so I thought it was a disadvantage and perhaps even um, unfortunate that I didn't have any Brothers siblings mm -hmm. because I had the privilege of washing the dishes, dusting the house, running the vacuum cleaner, cutting the grass, sweeping the garage. Mm -hmm. I did what the girls would have done as well as the boys. Yes. So I had the blessed privilege of doing all of the chores by myself. When you were in elementary school, uh, did you already have a pattern to your life? Was there a favorite subject as well as maybe a favorite teacher that helped you over the humps? Well, as I stated, Ms. Hines was very important because that was a culture shock for me to move from a predominantly black school yes. and then to be bused in the first grade to a school uh, where at that given point in time, uh, we were most definitely a minority. Yes. And then in relationship to that, I made about five friends uh, who were also bused from my neighborhood to that school. And with regards to that, those friendships remain to this day. Several of them are also working in the area of television. They're in various parts of the country, but they continue to keep touch with me because that was a major culture shock for yes. us uh, to move from a situation where we were the majority in terms of African-American people, mm -hmm. and then to go to a context where there's only one of us in a class. And in relationship to that, that was the greatest challenge and struggle of my <clears throat> elementary years is to get adapted uh, to the culture and to compete in that context. But God blessed and that through uh, any number of years of uh, working through that situation, I think it has all proven to be beneficial. And that was a double bond that you had with those five young people that have gone on with you through these years and you've kept in touch. I think that is a real blessing to you. And uh, having a bond like that that's extended over the many <coughs> years is, is very worthwhile. From elementary, what happened to Pastor Davis? And so I guess what I'm saying about my elementary years is that I'm spending a whole lot of time just trying to deal with identity and understanding who I am in relationship to the world around me yes. and why my world is steady changing. But in relationship to that also, I think it helped broaden my perspective and become more inclusive in terms of my worldview as I reached out to others who were perhaps, you know, not African American or black per se, but they were of other uh, nationalities. So I think that was important at that point in time in my life. I think along those lines also, I think that one thing I knew about myself is that I enjoyed people. I, um, at some point, thought that maybe a comedian would be something I would pursue doing, because I like telling jokes. I enjoy well, being funny. Is, yes, that is exciting. Uh, but uh, on to uh, high, your higher education from elementary, uh, high school. What school did you attend? And so Favorite I went from teacher? Weber from Weber. Weber Elementary School mm -hmm. to Urbana Junior High. At that point in time, a friend, of I, uh, a friend of mine at that point, he and I had decided that we were going to perhaps pursue a career in the trucking business. That's All what right. we enjoyed. We had a fascination with big trucks. I had a fascination with buses, but I kept saying I wanted to drive a bus for mm -hmm. a living. He kept saying he wanted to drive a truck. And consequently, we compromised and said, I tell you what, we'll work together. and. Uh, We'll just drive trucks across the country for a living. And with regards to that, I was on that course. But then uh, during my uh, ninth grade year, I felt the call of God up on my life. At some point, I was a juvenile delinquent. I was in and out of trouble. They had tried get straight programs and all that kind of stuff, thinking that that would scare me into being a good young man. Yes. But a lot of the things that I was dealing with as I've looked back and reflected over my life, I was just acting out in response to the environment that I had been placed in. I was put into an environment that I was not familiar with, and that environment was also not familiar with me. Yes. And so with regards to that, there was a lot of racial hostility at that point in time, yes. and a lot of things that uh, was going on in my life at that point um, was a reflection of my frustration. But by the time I reached my ninth grade year, I had become focused. And in relationship to that, I gave my life to Christ. And along those same lines, also, 
a year later, I felt God calling me into the ministry, and I was saying to God, that's not what I want to do. Uh, I'm not really looking to do anything spectacular, sensational. I just enjoy people. I just want to live, you know, a simple life. But God kept calling me, and then with regards to that, I finally yielded to the call, and at the age of 14, I preached my first sermon. Your first sermon, and your mother was so excited. Here she has a young man that... Uh, has been uh, sort of rebellious, and now uh, the Lord took charge. That was wonderful. Yeah, she, she was not only excited, but I think she was somewhat shocked. <laughs> Isn't that great? And uh, then from high school, what happened? And so what that did for me is it helped me to get focused in my studies because, of course, during the period of uh, that elementary uh, years of my life, the elementary school years of my life, as well as those junior high, early junior high years, I was, number one, struggling to understand the environment that I was in. So that challenged me to recognize the importance and the significance of the education process. Yes. And so it took the call of God upon my life for me to get focused and then to start trying to achieve and compete and excel in the academic arena. And so when I went to the 10th grade year, I went in focused knowing that even though I was playing sports, my call was that of ministry. And so I started intensifying my studies, my, ha my study habits, my routines, and then I started taking more and more courses uh, relevant toward preparing me for the future. By the time I had reached my senior year in high school, I had taken so many of the elective courses and so many of the advanced courses until my counselor called me in and said to me, that I might as well graduate in December rather than wait until May. They said, because unlike many students, you never focused on any of the simpler courses. And so therefore, all you're doing every day when you come to school now is uh, enjoying freedom. And what I'm making reference to is I skipped all of the home economic courses. I skipped all of the wood shop and the automo uh, automotive repair courses all of the uh, recreation type classes we identified at yes. that time. And I started dealing with uh, ancient history, you know, medieval history, and, and I kept taking advanced math classes, and I kept going through all those. And so my senior year was nothing but recreation. And so I think during my senior year, I had one class that was underwater basket weaving, then I went to home <laughs> economics, then I went to uh, auto, uh, uh, auto shop, and then I went to wood shop. And so my, my uh, counselor said, since you've done so much work and you've done all of the required courses, plus you've taken advanced courses and this and the other, you have the required amount of credits to graduate. Matter of fact, you're over at this point, and uh, I recommend that you go on to college. And so I went on, graduated in December of my senior year in high school, and I went on to a junior college in uh, Champaign, which was known as Parkland College. It still exists, and that's where I did my freshman semester, and then. In the fall of the year, I transferred to Bishop College, which was located in Dallas, Texas, and therefore I began to intensify my studies in the area of religion. I'm going to leave you there because I would need to come back and find out what moved you from Illinois to Bishop College, and that sounds like an exciting adventure, but uh, we need to talk with Wanda. So with your permission, we're going to let you rest for a moment, and we're going to clue in on Miss Wanda. Uh, Wanda, would you look out into your camera and give us your basic genealogy so that we'll have that on the record? I was born to the parentage of Jimmy and Ruth Bolton, and I was born in Tresvent, Tennessee. In Tennessee. And uh, my husband teases, teases me about that, but uh, we lived there until I was about six weeks old, and then we moved to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh -huh. so. And I grew up there, attended the public school system, Grad Where'd you go to elementary? I also went to Dr. Hayes School. Dr. Hayes School, and then on to Urbana. And after that, I transferred to Yankee Ridge. Um, okay. I was also a part of that busing transition, um, but I went to a different elementary school. To a different school. elementary school. Mm -hmm. In elementary school then, um, at Yankee Ridge, uh, do you have any mentors, any real wonderful memories? Did you make some uh, uh, bonding people, uh, su such as... Uh, Pastor Davis's name? My experience was somewhat different. Oh. I was a very sensitive child right. and um, was one that was 
probably the object of a lot of teasing. Mm -hmm. And so I had a real difficult time making that transition. Yes. But there was one teacher in particular that just sort of took me under her wing. Yes. And um, I still keep in contact with her today, Mrs. Proctor. Yes. She was my fifth grade homeroom teacher mm -hmm. and uh, made a great influence and impact in my life. And, mm -hmm. um, but overall, it was, it was a good experience. It, you know, I look at it now and, and laugh about some of the things that happened. The elementary but, um, school was an experience, wasn't it? Yes. And then yes. from uh, there to junior high? On to junior high. And uh, there... At uh, the same junior high at Urbana or another one? Urbana. Okay. Same high, same okay. junior high. Of all course, right. I was two years ahead of my husband. That's all right. <laughs> and um, went there, and th there was a, a lady, a teacher there that was uh, very influential in my life as well, Mrs. Somerville. Mm -hmm. And um, was there, and then went on to the high school there all in right. Urbana. Let's get this high school. That's very important. When you uh, leave from your junior high into the high school, uh, how did how did uh, you function? Uh, were you uh, very uncomfortable being a shy person, as you have said. Did you make that transition easily? That was a pretty easy transition. And by then, um, I had matured a lot. I was yeah. involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> both at school and at church. Yes. And um, somewhat coming into my own self-identity and mm -hmm. um, feeling good about myself at that time. So that was, that was a good time for me. High school was good. Uh, favorite teachers, favorite subjects, uh, academic academic subjects, and your electives? Uh, I continue to remain in contact with the Somervilles, okay. and um, my strengths at that time were English and writing. I love to write, and yes. that continues to be uh, one of my strengths. Yes. So that was probably my favorite and, subject. And after uh, high school, what happened to Wanda? After high school, I t also went to Parkland College. Good. And um, after graduating from there, that's when Denny proposed to me. That's when we met. <laughs> and how did he find you? Were you all acquainted uh, at either of the schools? Actually, we grew up together. You grew Somewhat up Somewhat grew up together. Yes, we, uh -huh. we grew up in the same neighborhood, and our parents knew each other. Our parents attended the same church, yes. um, same home church. And, but we don't, I don't recall him until we were teenagers, probably around the age of um, 16, he was yes. 14, when he first started preaching. Yes. And um, I was there for his first sermon and um, sang that yeah. night mm -hmm. of his first sermon and mm -hmm. then we began dating after mm -hmm. that and he went on to, to Bishop, mm -hmm. came on to Bishop and we had a long distance relationship for three years and then we got married. Then, how about your uh, vocal experiences? Since you are so gifted vocally, how did that come about? W were you a trained or are you a natural born genius at singing? <laughs> um, I was never trained. I never had formal voice lessons or anything like yes. that. I did take piano lessons for a while. Um, but it's just, it's a God given gift, I believe, and um, I've been singing since I was in the seventh grade. I was about 12 years old when I realized that I could sing. Did you all marry in Illinois? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's all right. So you're going to get to come to Bishop College Arena when he comes to Bishop then, right? Well, actually, we were married the week after his graduation. Oh, I see. So he graduated from Bishop one week, and then we got married the next week, and then about two weeks later, I moved down to Dallas with them. Down to Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Brother Denny, uh, moving to Dallas, Texas and Bishop College, uh, were there mentors here at Bishop? We need to talk a little bit about that because I know you have some ties with that and would you like to discuss anything about that? Well, let me say this, that one of the things that uh, prompted me to come to Bishop College is that Bishop College at that time was responsible for producing at least 70 to 75 percent of the nation's leading African-American pastors. Yes. And so with regards to that, all over this country, in various major cities, there are bishopites who are pastoring major congregations. Yes. And so it, there were pastors in my home state that encouraged and inspired me to go to Bishop College. Uh, leaders in our state, such as Dr. Shelvin Hall, uh, he was a bishop graduate, he was president of our Baptist Convention at one point in the state of Illinois. Um, my father in the ministry, Pastor Lindy Savage, he also 
encouraged me to go to Bishop College. And so when um, my ministry took off at the age of 14, I got a lot of exposure and a lot of opportunities to preach in black and white churches alike. And uh, I got a lot of media and press coverage out of all of that. But then others also recognized the gift that was in me and encouraged me to go to Bishop, saying that if you want to be your best and develop to the best of your ability, we recommend that you go to Bishop College. And so in so doing, um, God has richly blessed my life. At Bishop, did you have a favorite professor or two, and why? Well, I would have to say Dr. John Mangrum was probably one of the toughest professors I had initially, and uh, I thought that uh, at points he was very difficult and hard to work with, but then I also discovered in the end that he really loved us in a special way, that uh, he challenged us to be our best, and that with regard to that, sometimes he has to bring our eagles down a notch as well as um, refocus our attention uh, because he oftentimes would state that when we uh, arrived at Bishop College from our local home churches that they were, that our home churches were fascinated and impressed with us and so they told us we were great even when we were not and so he felt it was his job to humble us first and then give us the tools to become yes. more effective and then to be better at what we're doing and so I, I appreciate Dr. John Mangrum for that. And uh, while he's at, now he's out of Bishop, what's Wanda doing in these years? Well, the children came shortly after. All right, <laughs> and we're gonna let you name the children. Okay, uh, Candace, who is now 16, and Denny Dwight the second, who's 13, and then some years later, Destiny came along and she's now six. Um, what, one of the things that I prayed about it's funny now that I think back about it, but before we got married, I prayed that God would, um, would not allow him to pastor a church until after we had been married for at least one year. Yes. And um, the night of our first anniversary, we were in a church meeting and he was accepting his first church. It so. all fit your plan. Well, I said, if I had known that, I would have asked for five. For five, <laughs> <laughs> instead of one. <laughs> but, um, I was working at, at a bank at that time, and, yes. and then the children began, began to come along, so I quit my job, and I was home for a year, and then decided that that was a good time for me to return to school. Yes. So I went back to school and obtained my bachelor's and my master's degree. In what and, arena? Um, my undergrad was in rehabilitation science, All right. and my graduate degree is in social work. And. Um, so I did that, and then one year after graduating with, in social work, I started working in the field of adoption. How wonderful. And I did that for five years, yes. and, um, and now I'm, I'm, I've stayed, I'm home for a little bit, but I'm also back in school again. I'm at Truett Seminary now working. At Truett Seminary, yes. still pursuing that elusive dream, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be the wife of a very famous pastor of one of the largest churches in the Metroplex, 6,000 plus members and another congregation in a, another city and busy as he can be um, meeting the needs of all of that? My On television oh. <laughs> here before the good Lord and everyone. I tell you, and I, I'm being very honest with you, my experience as being a pastor's wife has been a very positive one. And um, our family is priority for us. And so the church and all of that, um, that's what God has called him to do. And my position is to support him and to yes. encourage him in that. But it's been a very positive experience. Both churches where he has pastored have been very loving people Yes, and um, it's just been a blessing to be a part of that, to be in a to be in a church where we can serve um, such people that encourage us in so many ways. As T H E E pastor of St. John's Baptist on Jefferson here in Grand Prairie, Texas, when did you first begin your ministry here in this city? Well, I had been pastoring for seven years inner city Dallas mm -hmm. in the Fair Park, South Dallas area. And I felt the call of God leading me here to Grand Prairie in 1991. 
And so it was in February of 91 that I first arrived here, preached my initial sermon, and then it was uh, a couple of months later that I had actually accepted the call to be the pastor of St. John Baptist Church. And there were how many members when you first came here? When I first arrived, um, the church was in transition, and so with regards to that, we had taken a census, a census of the congregation. We had 166 uh, members at that time. This year, we're reporting uh, 8,500. 8,500. That is just fantastic. And tell us about uh, the call for the new building and the additions and all of the things that have happened to St. John, and especially after losing uh, uh, King David Daniel, who was one of the stalwart members at the beginning of uh, St. John's. Tell us a little bit about your experience there. Well, God has really been good to me, and God has blessed my pastorate there. Yes. And in so much that I've come to the area, I had to meet many personalities who have made great contributions to the area. And one in particular that you did make reference to is uh, late Dr. David King, uh, King David Daniels. Mm -hmm. It was interesting about him that he worked in such a way that he impacted the community by being, uh, I think, the first African-American uh, principal yes. uh, in the city. And then we've been blessed to have the new school built and named after him as well as the street there uh, adjacent to the school. Uh, recognizing him, I get twisted at times talking about his name because the humility by which he served was yes. commendable. Um, it was only upon his death that I found out particularly that his name was King David Daniels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked uh, what was it about him that caused him to refer to himself as David Daniels for the years that I pastored him. And he said that he just knew that in the times in which he was climbing, to make reference to himself as King David Daniels would have been difficult to yes, be accepted. Yeah. And so he went with David. Mm -hmm. And so with regards to that, I'm appreciative for him. And then I'm also appreciative for him because in the days of Bishop College, he was one of the greatest uh, fans we had. And therefore, he came to the school and threw tailgate parties and all those kind of things and uh, really was connected with the school. Other personalities like Sally Moore has been a very good uh, inspiration and a help to me. But then there's been any, any number of tremendous other souls that have made up the 166 who gave me a chance and have helped me to succeed. And I just want to thank God for all of them. And you want to thank your beautiful wife and your three wonderful children for being a compliment, not only to yourself, but to this community and uh, in the, I guess we Most have- Most definitely so. They yes. have been there with me all along and they continue to support me mm -hmm. and continue to uh, give me the encouragement when there's time. So I feel like uh, giving up. Well, we wish you God's blessings because uh, uh, Mr. Tovar says we're out of time and I could have gone on with you all for another 30 minutes at least, but. Thank you all so much for sharing your lives and, and for sharing your lives particularly in Grand Prairie, Texas at St. John's. And thank you all for the interview. It's very precious of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us and this today. This is Ruthie Jackson reminding you that history is as we live and do.